Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In today's episode, we're talking about the efforts to place podcast episodes behind subscription paywalls. Back in June, the Interactive Advertising Bureau released a report estimating that the podcast industry generated $479 million in 2018 and is projected to make $1 billion by 2021. Not only is this a tiny pittance compared to the money generated by other mediums like TV and search, but podcasting has also been limited by its over-reliance on advertising. Unlike, say, Netflix or the New York Times, Most podcast companies have struggled to diversify their revenue beyond advertising, and most major podcast apps don't provide a way for podcasters to directly collect money from their listeners. But several companies like Spotify and Luminary are attempting to bundle exclusive podcasts and sell access to them behind a subscription paywall. Other platforms assist individual podcasters in converting their listeners into paying subscribers. The company Glow fits into the latter category. Founded a little over a year ago, Glow developed technology that allows a podcast paying subscribers to listen to paywalled episodes on their podcast player of choice. I recently interviewed its co-founder, Amira Valiani, about how she's solving the paywall problem and why she thinks paid podcast subscriptions will eventually scale. Before we jump into the interview, I just wanted to mention a few things. The first is my newsletter. If you're a fan of this podcast but don't subscribe to my newsletter, then you're really missing out. It's not just a roundup of links. I go really deep on the subject of digital content and provide in-depth industry analysis that you won't find anywhere else. In just the next few weeks, I plan to publish an article on why so many digital media brands have been consolidating lately and another piece about why complex media became one of the most innovative digital publishers. To subscribe to my newsletter, go to simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Okay, on to the second item. As we head into 2020, I'm looking for more guests for this podcast. You might not realize this, but at least half of the people who come on this show are people who listen to a few episodes and then shot me an email. I'm especially interviewing those who run profitable newsletters and people who work in online video. I also like interviewing founders of niche media companies. If you fit the description, definitely shoot me an email at simonowens at gmail.com. And the final item is something I've never asked about on this podcast before, but since it's the dawn of a new year, I thought I'd go for it. So because this podcast is niche and small, it's unlikely to make it onto any of those year-end best podcast lists. The only way people find out about it is through word of mouth. So if you get any value out of this podcast and want to help keep it going, could you maybe recommend it to your network? A simple tweet or LinkedIn post about how much you enjoy it could go a long way in terms of exposing it to new readers. Thanks so much. It's great having you as listeners, and I hope you had a happy new year. Now on to this week's interview. Hey, Amira, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So you had a kind of circuitous path before you landed in the podcast space. You started out working in the federal government, right? What did you do there? I did. I uh, I was a political appointee in the Obama administration. So I moved out to DC after graduating college and was interested in politics. Um, I was lucky enough to find myself first um, in a role at the State Department, first as a special assistant, and ultimately uh, ended up doing some speech writing for then Secretary Clinton. And then when she left, her, her whole staff left, and I ended up um, working as a senior advisor to a guy named Ben Rhodes at the White House, who uh, basically was in charge of shaping American public policy and um, it, it, when it came to our strategic communications around the world. And it was through running up in, in these lanes that I, I really became obsessed with media and, and, and just the incredible impact it has on, on policymaking and, and the cultural narrative. And that's when I decided media was where I wanted to be. So, so that was my, uh, my, the start of my path into, um, into the world. And and so do you feel like that working on the communications team that gave you kind of a unique outlook on how the media operates? Like I've written about this before where Obama was really the first in a lot of respects in terms of embracing uh, online media and other kind of traditional uh, or non-traditional forms of communicating with the public. I think you were there when the Between Two Ferns ap- episode happened. Did that kind of help sh- shape your fascination with media? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I saw I saw media work in all sorts of different ways. And I think what was striking to me is from the outside, it often feels like communications um, is 
is sort of a separate piece of the puzzle, right? There's there's policy making and then there's communications. But I think what I really started to internalize is how much how we talk to the world about what's going on in government um, and, and what the world sort of sees crafts so much of what happens um, globally, right? So we can have policymakers, but the, but the fact of the matter is policy making doesn't happen in isolation. And what people are saying very much impacts uh, how we're going to think about making policy. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, when I was when I was working in national security, it was when the Arab Spring happened. Uh, and, and how we talked about those protests, how we thought about <laughs> supporting the protests um, when we were interested in, you know, really encouraging people to uh, to drive their own self destiny was was really critical. The same way that you know we saw maybe protests started turning violent, or maybe they had outcomes that um, you know ultimately ended in tragedy. We we were responsive to those uh, those claims, and and those people were listening, right? Like the, it wasn't just that we would create statements and they would sort of go out to nowhere. You know, people on the other side of the world would constantly be looking for what is the president saying about this? What does the State Department say about this? And so it's it's really easy for us to say, you know, okay, this is a statement from the national security spokesperson versus from the president versus from a senior advisor. And, and like, you know, think about what the constant of that statement is and not really give it much, much thought because, you know, the average person um, in Maryland or California or Nebraska wasn't really paying attention, but tons of people, tons of people on the other side of the world were paying attention. And so there was a real interplay between between how we thought about communicating things and the actual impacts on policymaking. And then there's the other side of it, right? Which is like, how do you effectively communicate with the people, which is exactly the example you're bringing out with the Between Two Ferns interview, right? If you can figure out a way to really um, sift through the noise of, of what's going on in media and really create not just a, a message that resonates, but a way of presenting the message that resonates, that's ultimately super important. So it's not just about the substance of the message, but, but the medium of it. Um, and, and the Obama White House was was super, super creative on that, those fronts. And, and you know, I was proud of being part of that team. Well, after you left, you left the White House eventually, you and you founded a couple of different companies. Walk me through those. Yeah, so I left the White House and, and went to business school. And the reason the reason I went to business school was, you know, I, I had fallen in love with the media, I'd fallen in love with the impact of the media on the world. And I knew we needed different business models for media. And I wasn't quite sure what that model would be. So, you know, I went out to business school and uh, just fell in love with podcasting, honestly. So I, I went in thinking, I want to find a business model for media where listening and engagement and long form really aligns with how money is made. And my first year, I listened to uh, the startup podcast at a Gimlet, and that was 2014. And, and I just sunk into it. It was just so good. And I felt the emotions so broadly. And that's what I said, you know, I, I want to be a part of this medium. This is really interesting to me. And through that process, I started peeling back the onion and thinking, like, you know, how do people make money here? And so my first go at it was was from the advertising process. So I, I started working with a bunch of different podcasts from around the country to, to start to help them get advertising dollars. You know, working with a lot of the the advertisers that you still see out there. Great Courses Plus, Helix Sleep. Uh and, and started to help podcasts make money just, just through sort of the traditional relationship. And, and that was going well. You know, the, the advertising market and podcasting is booming, and I was building a ton of relationships and were, um, were growing quite substantially. But you know, what I started to see was so, – so, you were, like, so you were working as like, a, as like a personal agent where you would take a – you would represent a podcast and then you'd go out and try to find them advertisers and then take a cut of whatever you were able to bring in? Exactly. I was the middle woman. So I would go out. Mm -hmm. I would build relationships with a bunch of different podcasts. I'd say, hey, let me, let me try to help you find – uh, some advertisers, I'd go out, I'd find potential advertisers, I'd say, this is a great fit for you, and then I'd broker the deal. Mm -hmm. And did that, was that like a, did, I've, I've actually interviewed a couple people who have d done what you're doing, and to a T, they always talked about kind of how eye-opening it was, how harsh the climate was, especially for podcasts who had these incredibly loyal audiences um, who, you know, considered these podcast hosts to be almost like their best friends. They'd have like 10, 15,000 listeners and how difficult it was for them uh, to really kind of drum up 
advertising interest because one, it, it was kind of a new medium that that advertisers were still dipping their toes in, and then two, just because they just didn't have the scale. Did you kind of encounter these barriers? And I'm kind of, the reason I'm asking this because you eventually moved away from advertising. So I'm wondering what kind of weaknesses you found within the the advertising space while you were representing podcasters. Yeah, I think I think what you said is absolutely right. I mean, the you you see a lot of podcasters out there with super engaged audiences that are you know firmly mid sized, ten to fifteen thousand downloads per episode, and you go out and sell ads for them. And, and a couple of things happen. One is like selling that first ad is incredibly difficult because no one has any metrics to start with, right? Like all you have is number of downloads per episode. There's very limited demographic data. Um, but in addition to that, maybe you sell that first ad and maybe the direct response campaign is good. But in reality, like the amount that the podcaster was making off that ad compared to how much time they put into making the ad read good, um, how much time it t- take to collect the check? You know, like, like this is a business where people are still literally mailing checks. Um, it, it was just so, um, so difficult for the podcaster. So, so yeah, one, we'd have these, these podcasts with great in-depth audiences, but because there were topics that weren't traditionally, um, related to really lucrative industries, you know, it was an art history podcast versus a, a show about, the law, they would have a really hard time getting that first ad dollar. But even when they first they got that first ad dollar in, you know, they look at the check at the end of the day and they'd say, you know, I'm making 250 bucks off this thing, and I have to cut my, uh, I have to cut my show right in the middle. They want me to read a script for underwear. I don't know if I really want to do that. And on top of that, they take six months to pay me, and so it's a really difficult environment to really make sense for the podcasters. And, and, and for some shows that work better than others, particularly shows that, um, you know, had, had figured out the system, maybe they were reaching an audience base that traditionally makes a lot more money, maybe it's something like tech or, or law, but, but in general, it's, it's incredibly frustrating for the podcasters we work with. And, and it's not that they weren't making some money, you know, you start to see traction and more and more people are interested in podcast ads, but, but the, the work in and the output were just totally disproportionate and you'd see a lot of podcasters just get frustrated with the process and I, I didn't blame them. And did that kind of start shaping your thinking about how they needed to, so maybe some of those smaller podcasts advertising wasn't the answer and that's how maybe what led you towards, uh, you know, what you ultimately ended up launching was, which was glow. Sort of. So I'll say very rarely did I hear podcasters say, I don't want any advertising, right? I, almost all of them were sort of intrigued. But what I found is it was sort of an insufficient revenue stream um, and and a really difficult one to come by, but but they were all hacking their own ways together to to make revenue uh, by engaging their listeners directly. And what I found was so interesting is listeners wanted to support them. And so, you know, I meet podcasters who develop membership programs where they literally, you know, hire these development teams offshore to build a membership program uh, where they create their own app just to distribute premium content. And they'd be spending all their time thinking about how to maintain this team overseas, um, you know, how to how to update the app uh, and make sure it was sort of up to date with like the latest um, iOS update. And instead of like working on the thing that they're really good at, which was the content creation and the membership. So it wasn't that people said, I've had it with ads. It's that they said, I'm creating something of a lot of value and what I'm getting in return does not seem to be proportionate with the ad dollars I'm getting. So, so I'm going to figure this out myself. And I saw a lot of podcasters go out of their way and try to figure out their own system to engage with their listeners directly and, and let their listeners pay them directly. And that was the inspiration behind Glow. It's like people are already doing this. They're finding success. It should be as hard as it is. And so t- when did you first kind of get the idea and then how did it grow from there into an actual product? And we'll, we'll walk through in a second how it actually works, but I'm just trying to get to understand the origin story a little bit. Yeah, it, it starts with me. So while I was doing the advertising side of the business, I also had my own podcast. And it was a local news podcast about uh, the town I was living, which was Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I had an awesome time putting it together. We reported on the city council election. I got all these people who were listening to it, who were excited about it. And at the end of the election, I said, you know, I, I want to keep doing this. I want to figure out how to make money off of it. And I went out and I interviewed a bunch of my listeners and and they were really pumped about it. And as I went back to the drawing board and thought about a business model, I I knew advertising was going to be a tough road if I, if I wanted to really make money. Um, 
And I thought a subscription model could work well. And, and, and where I was going in my head was like, let me build a subscription podcast with access to uh, probably a newsletter that comes out once a week and, and maybe add on guides for at, you know, where people got uh, information, access to schools, the newest restaurant openings. I was thinking of basically like a, a multifaceted local media company where people would pay for value. And people told me they were willing to pay for this stuff. He was grounded in tons and tons of user interviews. Um, and I turned around and tried to build you know, the, the MVP version of this. And it was really, really, really difficult. And what I did is I hacked together, you know, a version of Squarespace where I collected contributions. Uh, you know, I put, uh, I put information like Google Docs with restaurant recommendations and school recommendations. I have um, a MailChimp where I email out, you know, sort of the, the regular email. And then I try to pay well podcasts. There was no simple way to do that. And, and it, I got really stuck. And I think that's when I really started to see this pattern of, wait, I'm trying to do this. I just want to build an MVP, right? Like I didn't know if it would work, but I just want to start with building, charging a dollar a month to see if people would even pay. Yeah. So to, so just to kind of translate what you're saying here is you wanted to, you didn't think there was a good advertising market for you. You wanted a way so that people could pay you money and then you could deliver those people who were paying you money, um, exclusive podcasts that they were paying for in addition to the free podcasts you were doing. But because the app, because like podcast listening happens on a bunch of different apps, like the Apple podcast app, Overcast, uh, a, a handful of others, they don't, they don't offer any way to, to charge money for, uh, for those exclusive podcasts or to put them behind a paywall or anything. So you were trying to hack together basically a way that you could deliver them exclusive podcasts that only paying subscribers could get access to. Exactly. I wanted a way to be able to even to test whether or not people were willing to pay for my podcast. And there's no easy way to be able to charge to figure out whether or not I could create a business off of a paid podcast because of the way the current ecosystem was set up. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you, you have this frustration, how does that turn into an actual product? How does it get funding? Like what, walk me through that. Yeah, there's a lot of iterations of this core product. So I had this problem. I start to notice through the advertising side of the business, a lot of podcasters have this problem where we're hacking together solutions. And so I started with, you know, my, my own sort of prototypes for potential solutions and, and was trying to think of a way using what was on, you know, traditional tools that were on the market, just servicing a lot of different companies. And I, I just was kept hitting a wall. Like there was no great way to try to service this market. And so I went to a podcasting conference. Uh, meeting a lot of podcasters, trying to pitch them on my, at the, at the time, pretty lackluster MVP. And I met this one guy who had this show called Acquired. And Acquired is a twice monthly tech podcast. It's, it's, it's pretty well known. Um, uh, people who really like, you know, um, really in depth podcasts about startup world. And I was pitching him on using my lackluster MVP. I was a fan of his show and I said, Hey, like I'm doing this thing where we make it easy for people to charge for podcasts. Um, and get list and get money from their listeners directly in exchange. Like, here's my prototype. Why don't we try this for your podcast acquired? And he looked at me and he said, I run a startup studio. What we do is we help validate ideas, bring them to market. And we're actually working on a solution to this problem right now. Um, why don't we work together? You know, we, you have a prototype. Um, we can do better because we have engineers and designers that can help make this better. And so what happened is through that chance meeting, we collaborated on what a, a much better version of this product could look like that made it really simple for podcasts to be able to charge for content. And that was sort of the first start is, is we collaborated out of his startup studio, which is called Pioneer Square Labs, to create uh, a, a prototype product that, um, that could work really easy for listeners and for podcasters. So, and were so you hiring like one. freelance? Were you hiring like freelance coders to, to do it, or how were you building it? The startup studio they have they have engineers and coders in house, so we're able to use a bunch of their resources for, the, for this first version. Mm -hmm. And when did you kind of launch that minimal viable product? So we were collaborating over the course of a few months on a part time basis, and we we launched the minimum viable product with his podcast with Acquired about a year ago. So that's uh, November twenty eighteen. 
that was the first release of just, just required him testing out whether or not we could use this product to charge on a subscription basis for podcasts. And had you tried to raise money for it by that point? Or when did you, when did like the fundraising happen? We officially went out to raise money uh, over the summer. So first we want to see, could we have, could this work? Like, would people pay for podcasts? Um, and so luckily within his studio, we were able to work with them, you know, without, without having to go out and raise separate money and just use sort of their internal resources to build out the product. And so for six months, you know, we were collecting data. We were seeing, does this work? Are people paying for podcasts? And by the time we gained confidence that people would was about last June, June, 2019. And that's when we went out to raise money. So let's let's kind of back up and just talk about how it this product actually works. So to recap, the problem that podcasters are facing is that their listeners are spread out over a bunch of different apps. Most of those apps don't allow you to paywall content or collect money from users. So you need to provide a way for these podcasters to somehow get people to actually pay for the exclusive podcast and for the for to deliver it to them in their podcast app that they're already using so they don't have to download a brand new app just to be able to listen to your exclusive podcast um so walk you so like pretend like i'm a podcaster who's using or starting to use your service um how do i how do i direct my listeners to your platform and then what do the listeners do to be able to get my to sign up for my premium podcast yeah so let's say the business of content was launching a weekly behind the scenes editions where listeners could pay uh 10 a month to get access to the latest business of content they would hear a call to action that says, today we're launching the Insiders program. Uh, for $10 a month, you get access to premium content that no one else has access to. You can click on this link in the show notes or go to a link online. Let's say it's thebusinessofcontent.com slash subscribe. When they click on that link, a web view appears. The listener sort of sees the details of the program, uh, all with your branding. And they just have to tap really quickly a link that says, subscribe today. So they tap on a link that says subscribe. Uh, they check out using Apple or Google Pay. And then they're taken to a list of podcast apps. And it might say Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Pocket Cast, you know, the list of um, apps that most pot most listeners use. And so let's say you're listening to Apple Podcasts. Use the listener which tap Apple Podcasts. And then what you would see in your app in the library is right next to all your free content, you'd see the paid content that's only available to you. And yeah. Keep on going, sorry. And what's happening behind the scenes is we're actually creating a private RSS feed just for that subscriber that we can turn on and off depending on whether or not you've paid. And so that content doesn't appear on the iTunes store. It's not you know, something you'd find somewhere else. It's, it's just available for that specific listener. Yeah. So, you know, for I'm sure most people who listen to this podcast know, but like most podcast apps, they're not actually hosting your content. Um, you're hosting it on a separate website and there's an RSS feed and it's simply pulling the content through that RSS feed. So what you guys are doing is saying, um, hey, you just subscribed. We're going to give you a special RSS feed that is up where we're uploading these premium podcasts. Um, and you can you can basically plug that RSS feed. Here's a quick and easy way to do it into your podcast app, uh, and then you'll start for as long as you're a paying subscriber, it will upload the new episode, the new premium episodes to your podcast app. Correct, right. exactly. So, uh, so we make that whole process that you know, people sort of stitch together multiple solutions for, or offering a whole separate app to sell private content. We make that possible, you know, wherever wherever listeners are listening to podcasts, and, and we strive to do it with a, a checkout flow that's less than thirty seconds. And how big is the opportunity here? Because uh, you know the the podcast advertising market is still relatively small. It's probably going to cross a billion dollars by like 2021 or so. Which it's only I think this year it only generated 600 million. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, newspapers and other publications are making big money through um, subscriptions. Um, uh, the New York Times is now generating four hundred million dollars a year uh, in in subscriptions. Um, you know, Spotify is generating billions of dollars a year in subscriptions. Netflix, Disney Plus, etc. 
Do you think there's just a lot of money on the table here for this market for for subscriptions? Yeah, I mean, I would be in it if I if I didn't think there, there was a lot of money uh, to be made, especially for people creating content. Uh, it, look, like there's it's sort of a fool's errand to try to calculate the total addressable market because it's growing so quickly and because this is brand new. But but when I talk to people about the opportunity, you know, I really try to emphasize how under monetized the space is one in podcasting and two where the opportunity might be when it comes to subscriptions and why the economics are so good so if we look at it, just how under monetized the podcasting market is so the average podcast listener this year will make the entire industry about six dollars that, that's about the the value of a podcast listener when you think about it you know basically on an advertising basis so uh, you take the entire size of the podcasting market divided by average listener, it's about $6 per listener per year. That's about a tenth of terrestrial radio, where that number is about five, uh, $55 to $60. So in terrestrial radio, the average listener earns the market about $60 a year, and then a 20th of video. So, so just in terms of sheer monetization potential, the, the podcast market just has a ways to go. Then it's also growing an insane amount and, and there's just still a lot of growth to go. So once again, you know, if you think about podcasting versus terrestrial radio, uh, something about 20% of Americans listen to podcasts on a weekly basis today. 90% of Americans listen to terrestrial radio on a weekly basis today. So, so there's just so much growth to be had from a sheer market size capacity. Uh, and then the question is, well, like, why advertising? Why is advertising a really compelling opportunity? And from there, you think about the money being left on the table by any one particular podcaster. So if we think about the average podcast listen, if you generalize over all podcasts, the average podcast listen on a unit economic basis is worth about a penny today. And a best in class podcast will make about four cents per, per person listen. Uh, and so if you think about, let's see, a, a twice monthly subscription podcast that costs $5 a month, well, that, that takes that four pennies a listen to $2.50 a listen. So the podcaster just has a lot of opportunity to be able to make a lot of money on a subscription-based pod, podcast. Now, will every podcast be subscription-based or will all the money in podcasting come from subscriptions? No. But if you think about every other medium out there, there's a ton of money being made through subscriptions and direct payments. And as you mentioned, it's growing a lot. The pendulum is sort of swinging back in the direction of paid content and particularly subscription-based content. And so we're going to see this, this part of the industry grow massively over the next five years. And I really think it's going to be the lion's share of the amount of money made in podcasting five years from now. Interesting. So you think this will surpass advertising? I do, just because the sheer dollar amounts are are higher on a on a per user basis. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get the numbers wrong here, but if you look at Spotify's numbers, I think they make about seventy percent of their revenue off paid subscribers, even though paid subscribers only make you know, maybe twenty percent of their list base. Those numbers aren't right, but but they're directionally correct, and I think you'll see that across the board. Yeah, and then also if you're gonna add up the amount of money that's made through subscriptions of podcasts, you would probably have to include however much Spotify is making, even though it's hard to calculate because people are listening to both podcast and music, but there, that has to be part of the value proposition of subscribing to Spotify now, now that they're going to have so much exclusive content. Um, but I, so I looked into this model a few weeks ago for an article um, and I, the, the two most successful publishers that I've seen that have embraced it were slate plus uh, and I calculated, you know, back of the envelope that they're making about two point five million dollars a year based on just on their exclusive um, subscription podcast offerings. And then Chapo Trap House, which um, hosts uh, exclusive podcasts on Patreon, um, based on my calculations, they're making about one point five million. Um, do you think those are kind of uh, good kind of test grounds for or they're good examples of the potential or you think the potential is so much more than that? I, I think there's sort of two different um, two different use cases. So, and I think you know we talked about this when we when we met uh, over coffee a few weeks ago, Simon. So, you know, Slate is making about two point five million dollars a year through their premium podcast. I think they could be making much much more, and I think they're just getting started through the process. So, we started to see a couple of publishers that are 
bigger names really think about how they can make money through their podcasting business. And, and they've been running Slate Plus for a while now, you know, a few years. Uh, but I think they're going to supercharge that program. And I think you'll see a lot of big publishers really think about um, how they tie premium podcasting with their overall membership program. So I think there's a lot of potential there. What's very cool about Chateau Trap House is, is there, there aren't any podcasts making this much money. And so I think we're going to see – uh, quite a few indie podcasts really double down into this model and build really sustainable business. I mean, just incredible six six figure businesses off this. And then I also think you're going to see um, a growing current of maybe middle middle sized podcasts. So those in the range of let's say five to one hundred thousand downloads per episode uh, that are also going to make a really substantial revenue off this. Not necessarily in, in the in the seven figures, but you know maybe. Um, low to mid six figures because they figure out a business model that works and they really find a niche that is low to what they're doing. So where I'm excited is in the growth, particularly of a lot of these indie podcasts who, like we mentioned before, through the advertising model, it's just not working so well. But the minute that they can start tapping into um, premium subscriptions, they, they see a lot of growth. Uh, I'll give you one example is you know, one of the podcasts that uh, I used to work with in the advertising model made about $40,000 a year through ads. So really substantial ad business. Uh, but he figured out, you know, he was offering niche content that his premium subscribers were really excited about. And he said, you know, I could probably charge $250, $300 a year for my premium content. And if I get a thousand subscribers, well, look at that. I'm, I'm in a $300,000 a year business before my ads. And so his ad business is substantial, but his premium business is really strong. And I think you'll start to see more and more publishers or independent publishers pick up on that potential. Yeah, just to do the math. So I've seen, you know, evidence that, you know, because podcast listeners are so loyal that you can get as high as like 10% of your listenership to con convert. Uh, so if you have like a podcast with only 15,000 or not say only, but that's a lot, but for podcast networks, it's not a lot. 15,000 downloads per episode, a podcast network probably wouldn't even be interested in carrying your podcast for its ads. But if you could convert 10% of those, which is 1,500, at ten dollars a month, then that podcast with fifteen thousand listeners is making one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year. So you can see how this could be a solution for podcasts that are that have very loyal followings, but but don't, can't really attract good advertisers. Yeah, and it, it takes you from a podcast that you know you you're like fighting tooth and nail for advertising and, and trying to pay for um, you know and trying to pay for sort of bare minimum to one where you're building a thriving business and, and could do this full time and maybe even hire people uh, to help you out with it. And, and so I, that's where I'm excited about a lot of growth. So one challenge I've seen with these kinds of tools is that bec because it requires several steps outside of the podcast app, like you're leading them to a different website and then they have to bring the RSS feed back to it. Um, a lot of users have technical difficulties getting the premium podcast on their podcast app. What have you been seeing with Glow users and are they running into these problems? We built Glow specifically to address those problems. So, um, you know, we had seen um, the existing solutions that weren't quite built for this use case be really, really complicated. And what we did is we tried to make it as straightforward as simple as possible. So the idea is, you know, you click a link, you're on a web page, you click another link to say bye, and then you click another link to say subscribe, and then you're back where you're listening to your your typical content. So so we of course get like a, a, the occasional question about how do I access my content, but it's it's surprisingly rare. We we haven't seen um, a lot of pushback there, and, and that's one of the reasons where we're excited about this is because we've been able to help make take this thing that was really difficult to do and, and make it frictionless. So what about apps like Spotify and Pandora? Like they, they, unlike a lot of other apps, they don't use RSS feeds. Each feed has to be kind of pre-approved. Um, I'm guessing that your platform doesn't really work uh, with their with theirs. Um, does it? And if not, do you think that they pose a threat to this model? Uh, yeah. Glow does not is not compatible with Pandora or Spotify. Although, you know, if, if someone from Spotify or Pandora is out there listening and, and wants to work with us, I'd welcome that conversation. Uh, I, I think the short answer is no. I, I don't think it, it necessarily poses a threat this model. I think what we've seen happen over the past uh, ten years is content creators are are 
getting increasingly savvy about what happens when platforms enter the game. And so, you know, everyone's excited, or a lot of people are excited about Spotify entering podcasting and really growing at the market size and making good moves and helping fund a lot of content. But when you talk to a lot of content creators, they're, they're quite wary um, because they sort of seen what happened with YouTube and they saw what happened with Facebook and they know the movie of when a platform starts entering a content creation market, they bring a lot of hope because they help with distribution and they can also help with monetization because of ad dollars. But ultimately, you've given up control to uh, an algorithm that the platform controls and, and a monetization um, mechanism that the platform controls. And so what we've seen when we talk to content creators is is they're being really um, thoughtful about how they make money because they know that the best way for them to monetize is through a direct relationship with their listener. And so they are going out there, they're saying, you know, I'll use Pandora for growth. And, and um, you know, I love the fact that people will, that Pandora or, Pandora or Spotify might send listeners my way. But, you know, as far as I can, I'm going to keep double down, doubling down on the connection between my listener and me and grow that way. And so the, the creator is really going to drive the fact that this is going to be a market where platforms have a lot of power, but also individual uh, creator listener relationships are going to have a lot of power. Yeah. And I guess you could argue that if enough people adopt this model, then consumers will kind of vote with their usage in the sense of like, if there, there are three or four podcasts of theirs where they can only listen to the premium episodes on like an Apple podcast or an over overcast, maybe they'll transition more of their listening to those so they can get access to the premium podcast or something. You know, what, uh, one other thing, it, you know, I wanted to ask about in relation to the offerings is like, are there other things that can offer other than exclusive audio so that they don't have to worry about this problem as much like newsletters or discounted tickets to live events or other kinds of perks where even if you are a Pandora or a listener, um, you can still get some perks for subscribing? Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of demand for that among our customers and, and we're skinning where the pucks go. You know, um, we think... What we advise our podcasters, the number one question they ask us is, is what do I offer to my members? And we're realizing members value a lot of different things, right? One of the number one things they value is premium content, which is that's why we started. But but yeah, they'll often also go for a newsletter or maybe um, access to a course or some kind of guide. And and what we're doing is we're we're helping them start to unlock a lot of that potential as well. And and usually it's it's a couple of things. So maybe they'll offer premium content audio content in addition to a newsletter or premium audio content in addition to a one-time coffee tumbler. So we see we see content creators figuring out the right model for their members and, and we're happy to service that. And what in terms of like exclusive audio content, what do you see is working best? Like I've seen a few different ways that they've approached that some podcasters approach this. Some are offering kind of like a behind the scenes look. Um, some are publishing like raw interviews, like if they edited down an interview for the main podcast, you can listen to the full one. Some are giving like kind of almost like radio diaries that are kind of a little bit more personal. Um, and then others are just doing like just random bonus segments. Like, you know, if you're a pop culture podcast, like doing like some kind of TV show recap or something like that. What do you what are you kind of seeing kind of works best? It varies completely with, with the podcast and, and why the listener might think about it. So just like any product, we really encourage our customers to think about what is the job to be done when your listeners are hearing your show and how can you help them double down on that? So you know, we see, like you mentioned, a range of things, but uh, radio diaries, ad-free content, unedited interviews. It's less about choosing what, what particular piece of content from a categorical perspective you could create and more about thinking about what your listeners goals are and how you can help serve them so one example is um you know amateur our, our first show acquired they are a twice monthly tech podcast where they tell the stories of companies from inception acquisition the regular shows are well outlined it's kind of a fun deep dive into the history of a company and their listener goals are people, you know, their listeners want to get smart on tech and they want to feel like they know a lot about business. And so the regular show services that because it's sort of a fun way to get deep dives into the stories of particular companies. But these same people who want to sort of go behind the scenes and learn about tech and feel smart going to work also want to feel like they know what's going on in the VC market or what people are investing in. And so their, their bonus content is 
these two hosts on the phone talking about what they're seeing in the latest VC market, very raw, uncut, uh, just really insider's information. And because their listeners are looking for more information about this industry, they're really happy happy to pay for that. But it's, it's pegged on what their listeners' goals are as opposed to the fact that they thought maybe some behind the scenes content might be interesting. And every podcast can approach sort of what their listeners' goals are and what their membership offering might be in a different way. You know, one thing that I kind of kind of push with my clients who are doing subscription products is to make sure that the paid for product isn't too time consuming um, and that it's not of higher production value than the free product because the free product is kind of your marketing vehicle. You, you want that to go as viral and to spread as far as possible, whereas the premium product, it's your most hardcore fan. So they actually just want the more raw, less produced stuff. Would you kind of agree with that sentiment? Like if you were creating like a, a This American Life level show where it's very highly produced, you have audio sound engineers, you would probably want to make that the free product. And then the paid product is something where you might have just kind of like a very, you know, casual Q and A with the, with the people who are running it, because that's the stuff that'll appeal to the paying subscribers. Yeah. I, Do you think that as a, as a general rule, I think, I think that's absolutely right. I think the, the sort of conception that premium content has to be the more produced content or the more polished content, um, hasn't hasn't been proven to be the case with us i I think the the idea is premium content is you know figuring out like why do people love you and how can they give you how can you give them more of what they love about you and so it's it's sort of this notion of finding um you know in, in tech there's product market fit this is content market fit and just like when you find product market fit like they say the first version of your product can be uh, you the crappiest, you can be embarrassed on it, but if it, if it does the job right, like people will love you, it's, it's really similar to finding content market fit. If it doesn't have to be polished, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if it does the job that your listeners are looking for, they'll, they'll love you and they'll pay for it. And, and that's what we really help people uh, strive for. So, so I guess my final question is just tell me some, tell me about some of the most uh, successful podcasts on your platform. What are they doing that you think is interesting? There, there, there's a few models that, that really resonate with me that, I, that I'm a fan of. So, you know, on one side of the spectrum, if you are an ad-supported podcast, the, the easiest thing that you can offer is often ad-free content. And so, you know, we see quite a few examples of shows in our platform. You know, 20,000 Hertz is a great one where, where they offer ad-free content and their, their biggest fans will pay. And um, you know, they, they get a lot of support out of it and also – for the, the podcaster, it's exciting because they get the email address to the biggest fans. The fans are excited because they get to support the show and they get this extra perk of having ad free content. So that's one side of the spectrum. On the other side of the spectrum, we've started to see our first few examples of shows that are either entirely paid or, or majority paid. So they're starting to put the entire thing behind the paywall. And so one of our shows is uh, this one called Morning Coach, and it's a, it's a daily podcast. And Mondays are free, and every other day of the week is behind a paywall. And it's a thirty dollars a month podcast, so it's it's you know it's it's uh, it's not insanely expensive, but it's substantial. It's not just five dollars a month. But this host is an incredible motivator, and he has a fan base that that really finds a lot of value through his morning coaching sessions. Uh, and he's just outstanding. He's very consistent. It's like you said, it's it's raw. It's behind the scenes. It's uncut. He's very honest. Um, and they love hearing it. And he's someone who almost the entire podcast is behind the paywall. And he's been an incredibly successful host with us. And we've seen everything in between. You know, we see we see fitness podcasts, we see arts podcasts, um, a lot of personal finance does incredibly well. And so we, we've seen a big a big mix of things. But that's that's sort of the range there. It's everything from just offering ad free or just listener support even does well to someone putting almost the entire piece of content behind a paywall, just knowing that by offering raw, authentic content that you know, a small audience can get behind, um, you know, he can be extraordinarily successful. And then, by the way, you know, he he has somewhere in the neighborhood of four or 500 subscribers, but almost 100% of them are paid. So he's able to create a really fantastic uh, business off of it. That is his entire lifestyle. Yeah, so that's, that's what a run rate of like $15,000 a month if he's charging $30 a month. So I, I don't know his exact numbers, but, but yeah, that's the, that's the yeah. right ballpark. Awesome. Well, Amir, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? They can find us at glow.fm. Um, and also they can find us on uh, my Twitter handle. Feel free to DM me or reach out to me. It's 
at Amira Valiani. Uh, you can probably find the spelling in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, check us out at Glitter.fm and very happy to wax about uh, the podcast industry anytime. I'm a big believer in that we're going to see a lot more paid models and, and we're excited to be champions of that. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Simon. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care. Okay, that's all we have for you today. Be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next week.